Okay, well, good to see everyone. Um, here we are, Happy New Year, uh, officially. Happy New Year. And also with you. Uh, we're also making kind of a switch here. We've got uh, a switch into yes. Samuel and uh, the monarchies. I'll talk more about that in a bit, but uh, just wonder if there's any initial questions or comments or thoughts here this morning. Of yeah, course. Bob. Two things. First, uh, I'm looking at box 14.2, positive assessments of Saul and to the, on page 237. Uh-huh. Towards the end of that, it says, in the end, David loved Saul and this poignant poem, which can reasonably be attributed to David himself, shows it. How do we know? It comes, it's the same question I have about everything. How do we get to attribute specific Psalms or this, this poem to David or the Song of Miriam for that matter, et cetera, et cetera. And the second question is, and I know it'll probably answer it as soon as I turn the page uh, tonight, but how do you get second Samuel when he died in first? <laughs> well, it, we'll tackle that one first. It is called the book of Samuel. And if Samuel's the author, then you've got a huge problem. Uh, so, you know, my, the, the easy answer is, uh, you know, Samuel didn't write it, but the, the title is good because he's the, the star of the beginning of the book of the book of Samuel. Uh, and Samuel and the Tanakh, the, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, Trey, you want to weigh in there? Or? I thought what I read was that it was originally just one book and got split in two. Split by split when they translate into Greek. So uh, yeah, so Hebrew Bibles have a book of Samuel, a book of Kings, and a book of Chronicles, whereas Christian Bibles have six books. Uh, we split them all into first and second. So. The uh, the other question, it's it's kind of a scholarly. Uh, debate about those kinds of things. And there are some scholars that will attribute more. Um, a lot of the Psalms have a superscription, a Psalm of David. Uh, the problem is when the Psalm of David talks about the temple and the temple's not built until Solomon's time, uh, maybe that was a later Psalm and that's kind of a good clue there. Um, it, it's a, it, you know, David is certainly reputed to have been a poet and a singer. Uh, and so, you know, it doesn't, there's, there, I guess probably the easiest way it, I would, I would phrase it as to say, there are no jarring clues that would suggest he did not write it, perhaps. Uh, that, that might be the best bet. The other thing, um, you know, the, the Song of Miriam is really short and the Song of Moses is an expanded form of the Song of Miriam. And so it's easy for a scholar to say, well, that's probably an original nugget. This may have been original or it may have been you know, expanded later on. Uh, so the, the brevity of the Song of Miriam kind of lends itself. Uh, that's, that's probably something that was passed down, easy to pass down, uh, that, that very brief, brief little song. But you've got the Song of Hannah and things like that, too. Uh, good questions. And, I guess you know, I find it. Go ahead. I guess I find it just, I'd say cool, but that's not the appropriate term. Moving that we can actually attribute these words we're reading today to the ancient, ancient sources and the ancient human beings that lived there. Right, right. And, uh, you know, it's, it is, that is a neat thing. And, you know, scripture, especially the, DA, the Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic historian, they are trying to preserve everything. Even when things don't necessarily mesh up well, they'll just put all the chunks there, all the nuggets are in there. And uh, so I, I think we do have authentic traditions preserved uh, in there. Cool. That's, that's a great question. Other, other questions, yeah, Trey. I was wondering, since you know this author talks about how these are bits and pieces all sewn together and they're inconsistent, blah blah blah. What do Jewish scholars in the modern world say about the criticism of their scripture? Some Jewish scholars would be right on board with that, and some more conservative Jewish scholars would lean the other way. So they have the same uh, same spectrum that Christian scholars have. Uh, in fact, there are some very good Jewish scholars that you know, do work on the Old Testament uh, and are, are just are part of the academy, just like Christian Old Testament scholars are. So you've got the whole gamut there. Um, you know, usually more fundamentalistic scholars will tend to say more of it is absolutely original and not, you know, written later, not collated. Uh, and, you know, there, there's a spectrum. Uh, and and the, the, there's a far end on the other end, and I would go, I think they go way too far, 
uh, a lot of the, the far liberal, liberal, liberal scholars would say it's all made up anyway. Uh, no, I, th I think, especially when we're getting into this part, we're getting more and more uh, authentic traditions that have been passed down. But what do they say when archaeological finds tend to confirm some of this stuff? That's, uh, that's, that's uh, one of the interesting pieces, yeah, that they kind of scramble with. And we have that in the New Testament, too. And we've got scholars that question whether anything in the New Testament was said by Jesus. Uh, I, I don't go that far at all. I think there are authentic, uh, you know, people, people in oral cultures were able to preserve things by memory better than we are. We have to, we have to write things down and type things up. Um, I, I've told this story before. I'll tell it again. Uh, in the early church, so we're talking 300s, 400s, uh, or actually 200s for this story. Um, the pattern was when you became a Christian, uh, you got baptized, and then they'd give you some milk and honey because you've been fasting for a long while, and the bishop would lecture you and uh, give you a long sermon and teaching, and he would present the Nicene Creed, and he would say it, and then he'd talk about it, then he'd say it again and talk about it some more, and then he would invite you on the third time to say it with him. They don't have prayer books. Uh, you know, he's recited it twice, talked about it twice, and the expectation is that you could probably get in his slipstream and uh, you know, do a pretty good job of uh, reciting it upon two hearings. So those are skills that we don't, don't have. We are mentally flabby from that standpoint. Uh, Jimmy, you had your hand up there too. Uh, I was also going to say that part of it too is that a lot of times with the histories and stuff, they also didn't really didn't necessarily care exactly what was said sometimes and what but more about the like the idea of what the person would have done um not necessarily whether that event happened historic what we would consider historic or whether whether it's where you know the sermons and acts are they transcripts of a sermon or are they summary statements of what uh people kind of remember was said and i would say they probably are summary statements uh if, if they're not then uh preachers in the book of acts are very short uh you know, 45 second minute long sermons. Uh, you know, they're, they're probably summary statements. Yeah, Abby. Um, in chapter 11, verse eight, when it talks about Saul's first battle, mm -hmm. it said there were 3000 soldiers from Israel and 30,000 from Judah. Why are the numbers separated? Um, you know, later on, well, let's, let's we'll, we'll get to Israel and Judah later. There, there are there are, are already in David's time and Saul's time some uh, identities of you know we are the northern group and we are the southern group. Uh, David will actually bring them together. He'll be king. We'll talk about next week. He'll be king of Judah before he's king of Israel. Uh, there's a, a several year time gap in there, and he'll he'll combine them and they'll stay combined for David and Solomon, and then they'll split back up. Uh, and so they they have this identity that they are separate now. By the time the Deuteronomic historian was putting all this down on papyrus or parchment or whatever they were writing on, um, the split had happened again. And so, um, yeah, we, we talk about the, the states of the old Confederacy. Well, they're, they're back together with the United States, but we still can identify you know, the states that were part of the Confederacy. So you're getting some okay. of that dynamic. Uh, Thanks. And that, that'll, be a, that'll be an ongoing issue, that, that north-south divide in, in what we call Israel, between Israel, the North Kingdom, and Judah, the Southern Kingdom, is, is big. And we'll come back to that time and time again. Well, very good. Well, let's uh, dive in here. I'm going to share a screen here. Let's see. I had it for, for SOM yesterday, so it may be off a little bit. Oh, it's not too bad. Let's get over here. Not bad at all. How about that? Okay, so um, here we are, First Samuel, and uh, as I mentioned again, we are Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic, history, uh, and as we said in the Hebrew Bible, these are one book, uh, the Book of Samuel that we've split out, uh, Ditto for Kings and Chronicles. Review: We've talked about this. Uh, this Deuteronomic history probably comes from. Uh, a school of thought that also put down Judges, Joshua, uh, and the Book of Kings, and also collated a lot of the prophets later on. And throughout all these works, there are some coherent themes that it seems they're trying to get across, uh, being faithful to God uh, and God's law. And if you are faithful, things are great. If you're not, things are not great. And uh, later 
when they get to the exile, they use that as the reasoning for why God let them get beaten. It wasn't because God was weak. It was because God was allowing uh, them to be punished for not being faithful. And then we also talked, and we get more and more of this as we go through these sections, uh, that God is establishing a special covenant with the house and the house of King David. Uh, so that's, that's part of things. So historical record. Uh, you know, we talked about Moses, that there are probably some very authentic traditions of Moses uh, that are encapsulated in Genesis, but some of it may be legendary accretions or, you know, things like that. But more and more from kind of this point onward, the secular historical timeline starts lining up with biblical events. And uh, it, it, as we go along, uh, starting with Solomon, uh, you can actually say, I've, I've stood in the middle of ruins uh, from you know, a fort that Solomon had built. Uh, and you can see where the chariots were stashed and things like that. So um, with Solomon, it really is pretty hardcore starting to hit the archeological record. So the secular historical record not contemporaneous sources, but later sources that are non-biblical. Up until this point, we've been relying on the Bible only for the most part. Uh, now we start having some non-biblical historical sources that we can start lining up and comparing things. And so that's, that's this is kind of a watershed moment uh, because of that. And, and, and so because of we're at this inflection point, we, we start to actually be able to slap some dates on these guys uh, that, you know, we've kind of been, well, Abraham was somewhere in the you know, 1800, 2000 BC-ish, uh, you know, depending on your theory, but we, we got some pretty precise dates here uh, that David took over in 1005 BC. So right at the turn of the millennium is the time of David. He's a real handy guy to keep in mind in the Old Testament. Uh, turn of the millennium, you know, is, uh, is the reign of King David. And so, yeah, that's a, that's a good, easy handle to always remember. And then Solomon uh, later uh, in that century. All right, but again, a uh, caveat, when we say history, uh, this is not modern history as we uh, post-enlightenment folks tend to understand and define it. Uh, oh crud, whoo, that was wild. Okay, let's try it again. Um, come on. No, oh, I don't want to be there. Why is that coming? All right, so not history as we define it. Um, and even a, a thousand years later, Roman history is not what we would call history as we define it. Uh, probably the closest parallel to a good, solid his, ro Roman historian, we would probably classify that as a historical novel, a novel based on true facts and trying to relay true characters, but you know, some stuff is fictionalized. Uh, that's just the way they wrote history, and they didn't have the idea that we have of history being kind of a separate, uh, separate discipline. That uh, you know, we 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 think of history kind of being like facts. Uh, okay, history is just a string of facts and dates, and we put the pearls on this string and kind of have this chain of events. Well, ancients were much different. They took what they considered real historical facts, but they would paint with them or play with them and make them uh, fit their agenda. And they were unapologetic about that. You, you tell these stories for a reason, political reason or uh, moral, to teach a moral lesson. You know, we have stories about George Washington that we've made up about chopping down the cherry tree to teach a moral lesson. Uh, that, that is what history was like in the time of uh, the ancients. And so uh, one image that might be helpful is maybe you think of it like colored sand. They take these colored granules of sand and then they try to make a painting with them uh, and put them into a larger picture that makes a picture that they want us to see. And there are times when that is fluid, uh, but then again, if you fire uh, sand, it becomes glass. And with scripture as we have it now, it has been locked in. So uh, we've kind of got their finalized version, but there are various versions where the sand is a little more movable and they're able to you know, move chunks and get them uh, together. Maybe a mosaic, you might think of a mosaic that's been fired and, and vitrified too. Um, so any, any questions about that? So we just need to keep that in mind. History is not what we think of as history. Uh, even the very best historians are trying to make a point and trying to tell a story. Uh, and, and good historians today are not boring fact uh, you know, boring sets of facts and dates, they are able to make history into a narrative, uh, even more so. That was the primary reason to do it back in ancient times, even up through New Testament times. 
All right. So as the book said, it, scholars do, both scholars do believe that we've got a variety of these hypothetical sources. We have no evidence for, you know, the rise of David Chronicle or narrative. Uh, but it seems that there is some discrete material that really focuses on David and some other things too that have been uh, kind of glued together, uh, placed together in the sand painting or the mosaic, if you will, to make the big picture of King David. Uh, and there's lots of biographical detail. We, we really, uh, more than any other character so far in scripture with David, we almost get into his psyche. Uh, in, in a very modern way, we get a lot of detail about the man, uh, good, bad, and otherwise, uh, which is which is fascinating and wonderful. We've had some of that with the stories of Abraham and Moses and Jacob. You know, we get their their foibles and things, but with David, he is really, really starting to be uh, painted in in great, great, great detail. Uh, but again, that that detail is with that overarching message that the editors want us to have that you know. Being faithful to God is important. Uh, God will bless you if you are, et cetera. Um, our book summarized this nicely. It was at the end of the chapter. I wish he'd front loaded it, but he said uh, in, in these writings that God's hand is present. And he says, this may ultimately be the key to understanding the Deuteronomistic history. How were the historical facts, Saul's failure, David's rise to the throne, how do you explain those in terms of God's purpose? Uh, that's really it. Okay, we, we know these things happen. Where is God in this picture? How do, we, how do we put the historical facts together with the overarching picture of God's bigger plan? And that really does seem to be a huge part of what these uh, writers, these the Deuteronomistic historians, that school is trying to do. And then they ask at the end, had the seeds of, seeds of ultimate failure of the monarchy already been sown? Uh, even before the monarchy starts, Samuel's warning the people, you know, these are the bad things about kings. And uh, later on, we'll see those uh, in great, great detail play out. All right, so as any, any questions so far, thoughts? And I can't see everybody, so shout out if you need to. All right, so the main characters of the book of 1 Samuel, the protagonists are Samuel, and then Saul, and then Saul and David together. And then in 2 Samuel, David will take over as the, the main protagonist. Uh, and we've got here kind of a, 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 a shift. The, the beginning part of the book of Samuel narrates a period, a transition from being judges, having judges that are these uh, charismatic temporary leaders that rise up from time to time, uh, to a more permanent monarchy where there is succession, there are wars of succession, uh, the things you expect with kings and dynasties. So Samuel narrates, first Samuel narrates how we get uh, from one to the other, from this loose confederation with these temporary judges to kingdoms with kings. Uh, and the three protagonists, uh, Samuel is really in, an interesting character. He is a priestly character. He also is functioning as a judge, just like those folks in the book of Judges. And he's also one of the early prophets. I mean, Moses was a prophet in some ways. Miriam was a prophet. They use those words for them. But the more modern type of prophets in Israel, Samuel is really kind of prototypical of them. And so he's a huge bridge character. John the Baptist is a similar bridge character. He's the last real prophetic figure biblically, and he starts to transition things to the time of Jesus. Uh, Samuel's just kind of the same way, uh, transitioning from the loose confederation to the monarchy, uh, from judges to prophets, uh, and et cetera. And it is interesting, uh, I think I say this, I'll, I'll save it for a minute from now. Uh, Saul is the first king, and we see his rise and we see his fall. And David is the second king and the greatest king, uh, and we see his rise and his flaws. Uh, and in 2 Samuel, we'll see those flaws uh, greatly portrayed in great detail. Interestingly, whoever wrote the book of Chronicles uh, did not like those flaws. They completely airbrushed the flaws out. There are no warts on the picture of King David in Chronicles. Uh, David is a heroic figure only, basically. Uh, so if, if we only had Chronicles, we wouldn't have any of this, uh, the, the warts and the foibles of David that we get in the book of Samuel. Chronicles is a, much, is a later book. Uh, we'll get to that later. All right, the general outline uh, uh, here is, is uh, as follows, and we'll, we'll go through this uh, in a little bit of, of detail here. So 
with the beginning here, we've got the birth and the childhood of Samuel himself. Um, and it starts like a lot of stories in the Old Testament start. We've got a barren woman. Uh, so there's a, a motif here that we've seen play out before. And she prays to God for a child. Well, we've seen that before. We saw it with you know, Abraham's wife, Sarah. Uh, we, we saw it with uh, Rachel, one of Jacob's wives. Uh, you know, we, we've seen this before. Uh, we see it with Hannah, and we're going to see it, uh, of course, we've got Mary later on. We've got Elizabeth in the New Testament as well, the mother of John the Baptist. They are barren, uh, and yet they pray to God for a child. So once again, we've got that. Oh, Samson, Samson too. Uh, we've got that motif, but she does have a child. Uh, it, it's really kind of, it's a poignant story. I mean, she's praying to God, the temple, or in the, in the sorry, tabernacle at Shiloh, the tent, the temporary tent, uh, which seems to be semi-permanent at that point. Um, She's praying to God, and the, the priest Eli uh, thinks she's drunk and mumbling and you know, mumbling to herself. Uh, and, but she is praying to God. God listens to her. God grants her her prayer. And then when Samuel's weaned, she brings the kid back to, to Shiloh, and uh, she visits him every year at pilgrimage time, but she dedicates him to God's service in a very, very literal way. He is serving in that, uh, in that tabernacle. And it's fascinating uh, she makes him a little linen ephod every year as he grows. She brings a new set of clothes for him every year. An ephod made of linen is what the priests would wear. So she's dressing him up. Uh, and for whatever reason, Samuel is wearing priestly robes from uh, the time he's a, a, little, a little guy, uh, you know, three, four years old. So it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a warm, poignant story. Uh, I do have to share this and I'll probably embarrass him. Um, you know, I, I think of I think of this picture. Uh, you know, whenever I would cut the grass, uh, little Jimmy would uh, we'd keep him a long way away so stuff wouldn't hit him. But uh, he would follow behind, way behind, and cut with his lawnmower too. Uh, but with the priestly things, um, you know, Jimmy loved his little priestly robes that his uh, great aunt made for him. And uh, yeah, so sorry, sorry, Jim, I just couldn't resist. So when I think of Samuel and being dressed like a little priest. Uh, yeah, I think of Jimmy dressing up like that too. So, uh, this is great, right. great aunt. Great, great. Your great aunt, Renee. Yes, thank you. Jimmy's great, great Not aunt. That it Not that it matters. But, oh, but thank you. Ed. Thank you for that correction. You're exactly right. Uh, and as well, you should be. It's your family. So, uh, yeah. So, anyway. So, we've got Samuel in the tabernacle and uh, he ministers. And Eli is kind of his surrogate father figure because he's living with Eli, the, the priest. And Eli's sons are not so uh, wonderful. They're not so uh, good. They're, they're kind of wicked and corrupt and lazy. Uh, and so Samuel really is going to be the, the, the priest that kind of survives uh, and carries things forward. Now, there's all kinds of questions about, uh, is this a strict Levitical priesthood at this point? Uh, perhaps not. Um, we've got other people that don't seem to be of the tribe of Levi that do function in a priestly role as well at this time. It doesn't seem like they've really locked into only the tribe of Levi uh, can be priests. There's, there's some, uh, they're, they're fudging around a little bit at the borders here. Uh, that will get locked in later, but we're not quite locked in uh, yet at this point. Uh, but there is a wonderful call of Samuel. Uh, God calls him at night. The three times God calls. He goes to Eli thinking, uh, that Eli's calling him, and twice uh, he goes to Eli, and Eli says, well, it's probably not, it's not me, uh, must be God. Third time saying to God, here I am, Lord, your servant's listening, and God calls him uh, to become a prophet at that point as a you know, nine or ten-year-old kid, uh, young, uh, young call story. Uh, Samuel and Jeremiah were both called to be prophets very young in their lives. All right, so we, we get that, that narrative chant of uh, of Samuel. Then we have this Ark narrative, uh, some stories about the Ark, uh, and a lot of scholars suggest this was probably a separate strand that's woven into the tapestry, separate mosaic tiles that are brought into the picture at this point. Uh, but the Ark is captured and returned. And remember, I talked last time about the rise of this new enemy, the Philistines. Uh, the Jews at this point, you're kind of dominating the hill country. You know, the, the, the tribes have a little more land than that, but the, the heavy area of their domination is here in the hills. Um, Jerusalem's not their town yet. Uh, that'll be under King David. Bethlehem is David's town. Shiloh is where the tabernacle is. Uh, Shechem is where they've met a number of times uh, near Mount Gerizim. 
where the Samaritans will later uh, set up shop and, and worship and where Jesus meets the woman at the well in this, in this little valley here. Uh, so we, we've kind of got this domination of the hill country in the middle by the Jewish folks, uh, the, some of the tribes. And then we've got the Philistines on the seacoast here. And we talked last time about the Philistines being high tech, having iron chariots, uh, whatever those are, where the iron was, scholars disagree, uh, in the axles, in the wheel rims, in the uh, armor plate, perhaps. Uh, but in any event, these guys are in the Iron Age, high tech weapons. These guys are in the Bronze Age, still low tech weapons, uh, though they occasionally will buy some iron plows from the Philistines. They have to take them back to Philistia to get them sharpened because uh, they don't have technology to sharpen an iron plow. Uh, but anyway, uh, so you've got this kind of standoff here. Chariots work great on the on the plains. We talked about that before Christmas. Uh, guerrilla you know, warfare, foot soldiers with swords uh, dominate the hills, and chariots lose their advantage when you're trying to go up and down hill uh, and through ravines and stuff like that. So you've got this standoff here between these enemies. Uh, but the Philistines get into a battle, uh, and the the Hebrews carry the ark out into battle with them, thinking God will be on their side. Eli's sons are involved with this. And uh, they get killed in battle. They're apparently not doing what God wants. And uh, the ark is captured by the Philistines. And they take the word back to Eli, and it describes him being a heavy guy, and he falls back. And you know his weight causes him to break his neck when he falls back in shock. Uh, so that kind of strips off the layer of priests at Shiloh. Eli's sons are killed in battle. Eli dies of shock. Uh, so it kind of leaves a vacuum for Samuel, which uh, we'll, he'll fill in a little bit later. Also, the Philistines, there's a wonderful, fun narrative. The Philistines take uh, the ark back and they put it at the feet of their cap uh, the god in their temple uh, because their god has triumphed over the god of the Hebrews. And so at his feet, uh, the Hebrew god's throne rests. Well, they come in the next day and the statue of the god, their god has fallen over, almost like it's worshiping the ark. Uh, so, oh crud, well, they set the statue back up and they come back in the next morning and not only is the statue fallen over in worship, but his hands have broken off, his head's broken off. Uh, so their god has lost his power uh, is the message. You know, his, his hands that he does things with are gone, his head is broken off. Um, plus there's some diseases that kind of run rampant in Philistia. So they think, uh, the ark is bad juju, and so they've got to get rid of it. Uh, none of them want to touch it or deal with it much, and so they, they get some cattle, uh, some, some cows, and they hook up to an ox cart, and they put the uh, ark on the back of this ox cart and say, okay, go do what you want to do, and the cows, like Taco, Taco Bell, they make a run for the border. I mean, they just head straight to the border uh, directly, and it it ends up at a farmhouse on the border, and uh, the farmer kind of stores it in what's basically his barn for the next couple decades. Uh, so the ark is not in Shiloh at this point. Uh, it, it, it kind of sits and languishes in this border town uh, barn for the next couple of decades. David will retrieve it later and bring it to his new capital, Jerusalem, but that's uh, a, later, a later story. So we have this wonderful narrative of the ark, uh, kind of separate uh, from other things. Then we get a very brief mention, mention of Samuel as judge. Really only takes about one chapter in uh, 2 Samuel. Uh, but he does what the judges did in the book of Judges. He leads the people in battle. Uh, he also adjudicates. Uh, he decides cases uh, between people uh, during peacetime. Uh, so he functions very much like the other judges, many of the other judges. There were some that were more military leaders than others. But he's functioning in that judge-like role. But then uh, we really kind of shift to focusing on monarchy uh, in the book of First Samuel. And for several chapters, we've got this desire for a king being expressed. Uh, at this point, it seems all the neighbors have kings. Uh, the kings are probably kings more of city states than what we would call you know, nation states. Uh, but everybody else has kings. And so the Jewish people are asking uh, we want to keep up with the Joneses. Joneses. We want to have a king like our neighbors do. Samuel keeps pushing back and saying, you are insulting the living God. Uh, Yahweh is your king. Why are you messing with him? Uh, eventually he takes, you know, he goes to God. God says, okay, if they're dead set on it, uh, let them have a king. Uh, but warn them. 
the human kings are going to cause problems. And so Samuel goes through this long, long, long list of things kings will do. They'll take your money from taxes. They'll take your sons by drafting them. They'll uh, oppress you and all that. Interestingly, everything Samuel says will come true. Tiny bit with Saul, tiny bit with King David, but everything he says will basically come true under the reign of Solomon and his successors. Uh, so Samuel is a prophetic figure here speaking on behalf of God uh, and the warnings, uh, you know, we gave you fair warning. Uh, all these things you're experiencing a hundred years later, we, we told you this would happen and it does, uh, but you, you made your bed, you want to lie in it, go for it. So they allow them to have a king. And uh, Samuel anoints a young Benjamite named Benjamite, sometimes written Benjaminite. Those are parallel terms, Benjamite or Benjaminite. Uh, Benjamite named Saul to be the king. And there are several stories of Saul kind of being chosen, uh, probably several different traditions being uh, put together, three different mosaic tiles being put together into one story here. Uh, but Saul is anointed by Samuel. And he starts out well. He's a good looking guy, uh, looks like a king should look. Uh, you know, and David looks like a king should look. I mean, that's, that's something you, know, you want to have a king that looks strong in battle because that's part of his function. And, and Saul starts out well. Uh, trivia. Benjamin is a tiny, tiny tribe, very small tri uh, tract of land, um, very weak amongst the tribes. And so there's something interesting there that a Benjaminite is the first king. So that's, that's kind of biblical. The other thing is because they're so weak, they glom on to the tribe of Judah and stick with the tribe of Judah through thick and thin. And when the, lost, the other 10 tribes disappear, it really is the tribe of Benjamin and Judah uh, that survive together. And there's one other famous Benjaminite uh, who also happens to be named Saul. He is Saul who later becomes Saint Paul. Paul is also named Saul. He is also of the same tribe that uh, King Saul was a thousand years earlier. So that's an uh, interesting, interesting Benjaminite trivia. They're the two most famous Benjaminites and they're both named Saul, uh, though Saul becomes Paul uh, later uses his Greco-Roman name instead of his Hebrew name. All right, so uh, we have a king. And then Samuel gives this uh, wonderful farewell speech. And he says, uh, you know, he kind of says, uh, well, let's, let's make sure the books are clear. Have I wronged anybody? Do I owe anybody anything? They say, nope. He says, okay, I can, I can go in peace. Uh, and Samuel retires, but he doesn't stay retired. You know, some people you know, can't, for whatever reason, can't do that. And so Samuel uh, will come back into the picture after retiring here completely. He retires completely in chapter 12, uh, but then he keeps showing up again. So, so much for the farewell for Samuel at that point. Uh, and then we have this narrative of Saul messing up for several chapters. Um, there are three mess ups. And, you know, the, the book put a whole box there about you know, the good things about Saul because we kind of give Saul a bad rap. Um, there are modern scholars who think that Saul may have been mentally ill. Uh, those are our categories. Um, that was not the category back then, uh, but mental illness may have been a real possibility. But as the Deuteron Deuteronomistic historian or historians lay it out, uh, this is why Saul loses God's favor. Uh, first, he rushes into battle without waiting for Samuel to come and offer the correct prayers and sacrifices. He takes it on himself to do that and uh, Samuel shows up just after he's done that, basically. He says, why didn't you wait? Uh, here I am. Uh, so that's strike one. Uh, strike two, there's a, a story about Saul's son, Jonathan, uh, eating some honey. And Saul has said, you know, cursed is anyone who eats before this battle ends. And then dang, if his son hadn't eaten some honey. Uh, now, these are not great strikes, but th there are three strikes here. So that's strike two. And then uh, there's some other commands that, that, that Saul ignores. Strike three. And so as far as the Deuteronomistic historian is concerned, Saul has not followed God explicitly and God rejects him. Now we might have all kinds of other uh, things we might wanna say. Uh, we might even say, was this really fair? Uh, the guy that wrote first, the guys that wrote first Samuel, they didn't care about that. To them, Saul messed up, God uh, withdrew his favor from Saul. So that's, that's the theological bottom line. Uh, and he, Trey has his hand up here. Well, one of the things that the this author seems to indicate was uh, God rejected him, and 
but it sounded like they're saying God just plain old rejected him without any cause, which disturbed me because I thought he lost favor because he had been not paying attention, not doing what he was supposed to do. But this book made it sound like, well, you know, God rejected him, so he was doomed. And I'm thinking, well, if God rejected him for no reason, apparently, why did he pick him in the first place? Right. And God, God rejected him, you know, for, for reasons. The question is, are they good reasons or not to our mind? And uh, that, that's something scholars do ask. And, and that, that, I think that, that's part of that discussion in the book. Uh, and uh, one of the questions is, you know, is, is God, is God knowing what everybody's going to do, or does God allow people to make their own choices? Um, there are all kinds of questions about that. God's knowledge of the future. Uh, you know, does God know exactly what choices we'll make, or does God choose to forget that as he's interacting with people? Uh, you know, I'm not going to keep that in mind when I call somebody. Uh, they have the choice to, to make choices. So that's a, that's a whole other theological, that's a huge theological issue that we could uh, debate for hours and hours. Uh, that's a something we talk about in seminary over beers. Uh, and, uh, just, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough theological question, but you know, from our standpoint, these may not be the best reasons to reject Saul. He kind of like Moses. Moses made some mistakes, and for that reason, he didn't go in the promised land. We might say, well, that's kind of unfair. But the Deuteronomistic historian says this is why God's withdrawing his favor. But Saul is still on the throne. And, and so we have this uh, coming of King David, and really for ha almost half the book of uh, 1 Samuel, David will be rising, and Saul will still be king. Uh, which is a, a fascinating uh, dichotomy here. So God doesn't pull Saul from the throne, but God uh, lifts up a successor for him as far as the Deuteronomistic historian is concerned. And with David, we actually have three different stories, three different mosaic tiles of David coming on the scene, perhaps. Um, we have one of Samuel actually going and, and choosing with God's instruction, uh, which of Jesse's sons to anoint. And the old, they bring all the oldest and on down, and you know, God says, nope, 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 nope. And they're out of sons, and Samuel says, you got any more? And oh, there's like, you know, our, our kid David, he's out with the sheep right now. Well, bring him in. And God says, that's the guy, anoint him, and Samuel anoints him. Uh, so David's anointed. There's another story uh, that seems to be separate. Uh, the Saul is tormented by an evil spirit, uh, hint, hint, mental illness maybe in our terms. Uh, and they, they seek a musician to, to, to soothe him. Uh, you know, play soothing music, a court musician to help the king with his madness, and David is chosen. Um, third story is the great David and Goliath story. I wish we had time to go into that in great detail. Actually, John uh, sent, John Orm sent me a fascinating article about um, that there's a gate in a Philistine city that's the same height as Goliath, and so maybe the tide, the, 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 the number for Goliath's height is based on being as big as that city gate. Uh, fascinating. Also, uh, you know, Goliath is uh, six and a half cubits, six cubits in a span, and this is a cubit, uh, elbow to top of your fingers. Um, you know, so that'd be nine foot nine. A span is half a cubit, which is uh, thumb to uh, little finger spread out. Nine foot nine, which is kind of seems like a fairy tale height. Uh, there are a lot of manuscripts that say he's four cubits in a span, which would make him six foot nine with our measurements. Um, and if you figure, there's also discussion about how big a cubit is. Is it 18 inches or is it maybe a little smaller back then? There are all kinds of discussions about what the number of centimeters is in a real cubit. Uh, so probably what we're talking about with Goliath in the narrative is a guy that's, you know, six, six feet, six, three, six, six, maybe, uh, you know, probably not, you know, some fairy tale giant, but a big guy, especially when everybody else is five foot tall. He's going to, he's going to tower over them and be a big guy, but David faces him in single combat. Uh, Saul gives him his armor, uh, sends David out to fight uh, like everybody else is afraid to fight, uh, but David can't fight that way. The armor is too big and too heavy. And so he goes out with faith and with a slingshot and some rocks. And he doesn't kill Goliath with the stone. He stuns him with a stone and then decapitates him with his own sword. Uh, so wonderful, wonderful story. I wish we had time to go into it, but don't have too much. Jim. Yeah, Abby. Uh, it just makes me think of the Raiders of the Lost Ark film where the guy approaches Harrison Ford flashing his swords <laughs> and then Harrison Ford pulls out the gun and shoots him. It shoots him, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's kind of what the story is. I mean, and Goliath Goliath actually has a great line in there. You know, am I a dog that you come at me with stones and sticks? I uh, say that's a little pipsqueak. Well, 
the kid, the pipsqueak gets him, he's got the gun. Uh, as, I, as I've heard, Abby, I think uh, Harrison Ford improvised that scene too. That was not how it was. They originally filmed it with him having this big duel with the guy. And then uh, he improvised that scene and they thought it was so funny they kept it in that way. So, okay. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what I heard was that Harrison Ford was actually sick that day and tired of messing with it. So he goes, <laughs> this is stupid. If I've got a gun, I wouldn't duel this guy. So I just pulled it out and shot him. That's hilarious. I never thought of that with David and Goliath, but that's a, that's a perfect image. All right, so we've got these three stories of David. So David is now at some level, for whatever reason, in the court. He is the anointed king as far as Samuel's concerned. Uh, he is a court musician. He's also defeated the giant. Uh, and Saul promised a daughter to whoever defeats uh, Goliath. Uh, and so David is brought into court. Um, and, and David makes buddies with Saul's kids. Uh, he, Saul's son, Jonathan, becomes his best friend. They are best, best, besties. Uh, he marries Saul's daughter, Michal, or Michael. Uh, it's pronounced both ways uh, by people. Uh, Saul grows jealous of David's popularity as a warrior. There's a, a chant that people say, well, Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. Uh, Saul's wonderful, but David's even better. And, and so da David is a court musician and a court general. Um, and, and we kind of, you know, I've, I've said this before, um, we don't always equate uh, being an artist with the manliest of pursuits. Uh, we kind of see those as separate things, but in their day, to be able to kill somebody in battle and then sing a great song about how you killed him in battle, uh, that was the pinnacle of masculinity. And so being a musician was right up there making you a macho, macho man. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, we've got David there in court, but you know, Saul is jealous or insane or both, uh, or has an evil spirit, uh, all those things. Uh, Saul tries to kill David uh, a bunch of times. He, he actually throws a spear at David in, in the palace courtroom, uh, the, the, the throne room, uh, misses twice. Uh, he, he sends guys to kill David a couple times. One time, uh, you know, David's wife, Saul's daughter, intervenes and, uh, you know, and makes a little dummy while David is escaping. Another time, Jonathan intervenes and warns David to escape. My dad's about to kill you. So Saul's kids love David and are more faithful to David than they are to their father. Interesting uh, dynamic there. And so now we have, then we have a period of David on the run. He's kind of a Robin Hood character. Uh, you know, he, he has this band of merry men that a, 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 a glom onto him, accumulate around him. Uh, and he uh, is out there as a separate military force, uh, kind of almost as a mercenary for hire sometimes. Uh, and he, uh, you know, on the way out, he picks up Goliath's sword at the tabernacle because that's where it's been stashed since he killed Goliath. Uh, because of that, Saul kills some priests. That's also a big strike against Saul later on, uh, killing the, the priest at, at the tabernacle. Uh, David hides out with the Philistines for a couple different periods. Uh, he is a Philistine mercenary at the end, uh, right before Saul is killed. Uh, he's got this band of merry men. A couple times, Saul goes out to try to stop him. There's a wonderful incident where Saul has to use the restroom, apparently number two, and so he goes into a cave, and uh, while he's doing his business, David and his whole bunch of merry men is hiding in that very cave. They say, kill him. You got him under your power. God has delivered him. David says, I can't kill God's anointed king, but he does go up, sneaks up, and cuts off a chunk of Saul's robe while Saul is doing his business, and Saul goes back in the valley. David makes his dramatic appearance at the cave entrance and says, hey, Saul, uh, we were in here the whole time you were in here. And look, I, I got close enough to cut off a piece of your robe. If I wanted to kill you, I could have. I don't want to do that. And Saul says, oh, David, my son, uh, you are much more, more wonderful than I am. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, and, and, you know, it's almost, you get almost this abusive father type of relationship between Saul and David. You know, Saul is abusive. And then he apologizes. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, bring you back in. Uh, and that happens a couple times, uh, but David doesn't fall for that. Um, during this time, Samuel dies, finally, uh, after saying farewell half a book earlier. Uh, David gets another wife, Abigail. We won't go into that narrative. Uh, the guy curses him, and David lets God take care of it. Saul goes out again with an army to kill David. This time, similar pattern. David sneaks into camp and takes Saul's spear at night, 
uh, and his water jug. And then the next morning stands at the edge of the camp uh, a fair distance away and says, hey, y'all, Saul, uh, look what I got. I could have killed you last night. I didn't. And again, you know, Saul, oh, David, my son, I'm sorry. Uh, but David doesn't fall for it. David ends up serving the Philistines, but he won't fight the Jews. That was one of the things. He won't fight his fellow Hebrews. He'll fight other enemies of the Philistines uh, as a mercenary, but not uh, Jewish folks. Well, at the end, Saul does get in a big battle. Um, and at the end of uh, 1 Samuel, uh, Saul consults with a witch or a medium of Endor, uh, even before uh, the moon in uh, Return of the Jedi, Endor is in the Bible. Um, before a battle with the Philistines, she calls up the, the ghost of Samuel. Uh, witchcraft is forbidden. Uh, consulting mediums is forbidden in the, the, the law. Um, there are questions. Did she really call up Samuel? Did God really send the ghost of Samuel, like the ghost of Macbeth? It's kind of a similar thing Macbeth does later. Or the ghost of uh, Banquo, I guess. Banquo. Yeah. Yeah, which, uh, I, it's been a while since I read Macbeth, but... Uh, Anyway, they, you know, they consult witches in that too. And there's some parallels uh, that they draw, Shakespeare draws on. But anyway, uh, bring up the ghost of Samuel um, and Saul is out having a battle. Uh, meanwhile, David's off fighting the Amalekites uh, while the Philistines are fighting Saul. Saul and Jonathan are killed. Uh, Saul runs, does the honorable thing, runs uh, himself through with his sword. Uh, and David mourns. Uh, he mourns his friend Daniel, uh, Jonathan, and he mourns his uh, lost, abusive surrogate father figure, Saul. Uh, and at the beginning of 2 Samuel, there is a, a song of David, uh, a lament uh, for uh, these two figures. And so it's, it's a tragic ending for Saul. It's a sad ending for David. He, doesn't, he is raised up to be king, but he doesn't pursue that. He does everything he can uh, to not take out Saul. Uh, and Jonathan, the rightful prince, says, David, you're going to be a much better king than I'd ever be. You know, he would throw his support behind David uh, if it came down to that. But Jonathan gets taken out in the battle. There is another son. There's some dynastic stuff. We'll get to that in 2 Samuel. Uh, but it's, it's a very, very tragic, uh, sad ending uh, to, to um, the book here. So that's, that's basically. So we've got lots of tragedy here. Um, you know, Saul starts well. Uh, he wins battles, but at the end, he loses battles. He, he kind of loses the ground he's gained all through his reign. Uh, he ends up, you know, things are no better under his reign at the end than they are at the beginning. Uh, you know, we're back at square one. Uh, you got the tragedy of David. He's taken into Saul's family. Uh, you know, David's father, Jesse, is mentioned when David's anointed, but then drops out except as a title. David is the son of Jesse. Uh, David's father figure really is Saul. And, you know, sadly, uh, it's a horrible relationship with the two of them. Uh, so very, very tragic, uh, very, very tragic uh, book from that standpoint. Uh, and sadly, sadly, uh, David has been a, a hero in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, David will be a hero in the beginning of 2 Samuel, but David's flaws are going to come to the fore in the middle of 2 Samuel. And one of his huge flaws is David is a lousy father himself, very wanting as a father. Uh, and so Saul has not been a good model uh, of fatherhood for David at all. And sadly, part of the tragedy of this uh, dynastic uh, story is that David's going to make some bad mistakes as a father himself. But that is uh, 2 Samuel, and we'll, we'll pick up with that next time. So any, any final thoughts or questions from you all? Yeah, Bob. And, I found and, in the text, in the, in the textbook, it talks about David fights for the Philistines, but he won't fight against Israel. The way I read the actual source material, David and his, and his it's like 600 guys. It's, I guess, like about the size of a, of a company or so. David is prevented from joining the main Philistine army by some of the other kings of Philistia saying, well, He's not going to be loyal to you guys. You know, the last thing you want is him on the battlefield and have him turn against you. So it's you know, may, maybe it would be, it's got a what if history, but it's a different spin. Yeah, it is. Uh, part of it too, it seems that David wants to avoid it and it seems that the Philistine kings want to avoid it. And so, you know, it, it works, works well uh, you know, together there. Uh, Trey, I saw, it looks like John Orham has something too, but Trey, go ahead. 
I was just going to say when you were talking about uh, the you know manly man, and then he has to you know sing a song afterward, be artistic too. Right. Uh, that's a little bit like the samurai. Uh, they would you know fierce in battle, lopping people's heads off here and there, but uh, then they would compose haiku, you know, at their tea ceremonies and stuff like that. They had to have that aspect of their personalities too. In medieval knights, if you were a knight who could write poetry, uh, you were you were highly prized. And so, yeah, it's it's interesting in our culture. You know, we, we think of you know uh, you know folks that do more artistic stuff uh, differently than we think of our athletes sometimes. And it's you know it's, it's weird how cultures uh, bifurcate those sometimes. Uh, John, did you have something? Yeah. Yes, uh, Jim. I had a, my history teacher in college. He used to say, "There's only unity in the face of an enemy." And I would say in Samuel 1, the Philistines are a major, are a major character, the major character. And they may have defined the reason there were kings. They, they went to a king, uh, and I think our book alludes to that. Yeah. And so, and I wondered too, then in thinking about the Philistines, the extent to which there was interbreeding in the Middle East, and if they're if these Israelites have a distinct genetic makeup. And, and so the Philistines are very interesting to me. That'd be, that'd be fascinating, John. I wonder if anybody's done some DNA studies trying to connect the sea peoples to, you know, that's, that's I, I'm not, those studies may be out there, but I'm not aware of them. So that's, that, that could be fascinating. The train, Bob. Uh. I thought the Philistines were supposed to come from like the Greek islands. Well, the, the, the Philistines actually Google sea people, origin of the sea peoples, and uh, that is one theory. There are all kinds of theories uh, out there. Some have them coming from like Bulgaria and you know, Eastern Europe and coming through the Greek islands perhaps, uh, but starting way, way off uh, in the hinterlands of Europe. Uh, there is all kinds of scholarly debate. It's not, these are not biblical scholars, these are ancient historical scholars because you know, biblical scholars don't care about the Philistines too much, except for uh, this part. But yeah, the Sea Peoples are highly debated, as I understand it. There's a volume of stuff out there on them. So, so yeah, Cyprus and uh, Crete, uh, perhaps, but uh, there's there's all kinds of other theories too. So, Turkey, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, yeah. So, take take a look, Google Google that. It is it's more than you're going to want to know probably, but. Uh, and Bob, did you have something too? From Jimmy, it looks like. I was gonna, I was gonna comment on John's thought about you know the unity of the DNA or not. Even now, you know, among Jewish people, this, the DNA is. Well, how about this? My daughter and her husband, my daughter Hannah and her husband Nick, both have Jewish dads, different ones, of course, and 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 Gentile moms, and they did a little twenty three and me a couple of years ago, and each of them have virtually identical uh, Ashkenazi Jewish background DNA, even maybe even some that kind of overlaps on one side and then the other half is whatever, you know, wow. Wow. Irish and French and Indian and, you know, the whole, the whole smorgasbord of Europeans where you can't really trace anybody, but one side is very unified. They have kept, yeah. And yeah, that's, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Cool. Anybody else? Jimmy, did you have your hand up or not? Okay. Well, cool. We'll pick up next time with, with 2 Samuel. Hopefully we won't have a, you know, six inches of snow on the ground, but uh, we'll, we'll pick up nonetheless. So good to see you all. And uh, we're, we're going to have the service here in a little bit. Uh, John Hollins is not able to make it in, so it won't have music, but Jimmy and I will carry on and uh, do our best. So uh, see y'all. See y'all later. Take care. Thanks, Thanks Jim. Jim. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you.